A suburban youth drawn to the music of the streets. He's breakdancing during the day, hitting some clubs at night. Vanilla Ice shot to superstardom. When Ice Ice Baby came out, it was like, move over MC Hammer. Everything happened so fast. You got 5,000, 10,000 people screaming at you. The recording industry built him up. I got these people all around me telling me to do this and do that. Whatever I would suggest for him to do was only for his good. But when the public moved on, he was on his own. He had just hit rock bottom. Found myself, uh... Writing a suicide note. Finally, Vanilla Ice picked up the pieces of his shattered life to embrace his past, his image, and his legacy. I had to thrust my shoulder off, swim back out, catch another wave. In 1990, Vanilla Ice was king of the pop charts, selling millions of records and dominating the airwaves. But just four years later, he was being mocked as a one-hit wonder. And one winter night, his friends found him collapsed on his bathroom floor. The depression about his career tanking was just killing him. So he ingested a huge amount of cocaine, ecstasy, and alcohol, you know, knowing full well that the amount could have killed him. I was lost. I had a weekend that lasted a few years, and uh, by saying that is I didn't know where I fit in, so basically I turned to drugs as an escape route. It was a shocking turn of events for an artist who just a few years earlier had found superstardom with the mega hit, Ice Ice Baby. In three weeks, it moves six million copies. You couldn't go to a drugstore, a barber shop, or the grocery store without hearing it on the radio. But a few years later, it all came undone. Ice was a pop culture punchline. I look back at everything and I go, you know, this is not a, this is not what I wanted. The baggy pants, the hairdos and stuff, it's not what I wanted to be recognized for. It was, it was really the music. What had started out as a genuine passion had somehow led to a life out of control. Vanilla Ice was born Robert Van Winkle on Halloween 1968. Raised in an unassuming suburb of Dallas, the young boy faced his first hardship when his father abandoned the family. I was really young. I never missed him or anything or had any curiosities because it was filled in by Byron. Byron Mino, car salesman and opera singer, entered the picture soon after when he married Rob's mother. My mentor, just the coolest dude, person, father, figure you could ever have. You know, he was really there for me. Mino supported young Rob's passionate interest in competitive motocross racing. His mother remained a constant presence, providing not only a loving home, but an appreciation and talent for music. His mother is actually a classically trained pianist. She plays guitar and she does flute. Very unique and talented musically. He was always interested in funk music. I mean, he loved James Brown, for instance. That was a huge idol for him. And so when hip-hop came along, he was like, oh my God, this is my kind of music. I didn't know that there wasn't other white people doing the same thing. I just, it just, it's what influenced me. And as soon as hip-hop came out, you know, I was really fascinated with it right off the bat because it was, basically, they took funk and then they rhymed over it. But it wasn't until I saw the classic cult film break in that he started to see himself as having a place in the culture he so admired. He had the broom and he would pop lock and do his whole thing, you know, and I was just like trying to mimic the moves and stuff and I had a little mirror in my room so I'd go in my room at night and be like, I can do it, you know, I can do it. His first real foray into public attention was of course as a break dancer. He would do some uh, freestyle rapping and break dancing in, uh, in clubs, uh, mostly African American clubs. I used to have a piece of cardboard, I'd make 40 bucks a day and uh, spin on my head with my little break dancing crew. Uh, my friends called me Vanilla, which I hated, because I thought it was kind of like, you just call me that because I'm white, but that kind of stuck as a nickname. Vanilla <laughs> Ice. Hitting the clubs at night, Ice was still just a high school student by day. He and his friends honed their rhyming skills in the school cafeteria. And we would crack on each other, rap on each other. Oh, your mama's got dirty socks and, you know, stuff like that. I would go home thinking, what can I come back for lunchtime tomorrow and come back? Because my friend, he got me good today. So I'm going to come back on him tomorrow. So I would think of these rhymes. While Ice practiced his rhymes in obscurity, rap and hip-hop as an art form was becoming more diverse. He 
DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince and their brand of pop rap. Hip hop was picking up on some suburban themes. It was being more directed toward the youth. So all of a sudden on MTV you had artists like N.W.A. who were more hardcore gangster rap. But you also had a lot of artists who were very pop oriented, very mall oriented. Even though a white suburban teen hardly fit into the local hip hop scene, Ice was determined. Even my mom told me white kids don't rap. People tell me, you know, don't do that. And I'm the kind of guy that just believes in himself. But I'm on a path. And I'm going to walk my path never narrow. I'm going to walk it wide like I own it. Ice ventured across town into rough African-American neighborhoods in search of the music that was quickly becoming his obsession. He's break dancing during the day at the mall on a piece of cardboard and uh, hitting some clubs at night. And it was at one local club called City Lights that Vanilla Ice's life took a dramatic turn. They had a talent contest there one night. I'm, I'm sitting there and my friend dares me to get up on stage and I'm like, nah, man. He goes, man, you can tear, look at all these people up there, bro. You can outdance them, man. You can outdo, perform these people. So I was like, all right, I'll do it Why not for fun, you know. So I was just, I was spinning on my head a little bit. And I got up and I grabbed the microphone, acapella, no beat, playing nothing, and just busted out a rhyme. And they were just like, whoa. Ice had no idea that the audience was packed with music industry insiders looking for the next big thing. After the show, he was approached by the club's owner. I mean, Kwan, who owned City Lights and was very involved in the record industry, the moment he saw Vanilla on stage, he was like, this is gold. Kwan became Vanilla Ice's manager and helped him connect with a local record label. So long story short, I met, I got a, uh, a small record deal uh, out of Atlanta called Ichiban Records. Ichiban sent Ice into the studio with a shoestring budget to record his songs. One of the songs for the album was a track that Ice had written when he was only 16 years old, Ice Ice Baby. My DJ Earthquake had a uh, SP-1200, it was like a sampling machine that he got at a pawn shop, and I had a, a bunch of records and stuff, you know, my brother's old records, and that was one of them, Queen David Bowie, and we just threw that in there, oh that sounds good. The sample was almost an afterthought, but it was one that would change Vanilla Ice's life forever. In 1989, Vanilla Ice was just a white kid from the suburbs who loved to rap and break dance. But when he took part in a talent contest in a local club, he immediately caught the eye of record executives searching for new talent and was snatched up by Ichiban Records. A few months later, Ice's first album, Hooked, was released. I actually looked at a piece of wax with my recordings on it. I think I slept with it. The album sold a mere 38,000 copies, but enabled Ice to get more work as a musician. I was uh, on the Stop the Violence tour with Ice-T, Set the Sonic, Mix a Lot. I was the opening act for the opening act for the opening act for the opener. <laughs> I didn't care. I was just so thrilled and excited to tell all my friends. Even as an unknown, Ice felt he was living the dream. Music was his passion, and there would be no turning back. I was going to stay in high school and listen to these boring teachers and drool on my desk, uh, or basically go around the world on a tour and make millions of dollars, and I think we know which way I chose. <laughs> the first single was a remake of Wild Cherry's Play That Funky Music White Boy. Ice Ice Baby was merely the B-side. A DJ in Georgia flipped the record and thought that Ice Ice Baby had something to it. And then it was just like this phenomenal thing just took off. As soon as the Atlanta station started playing Ice Ice Baby, the phone lines were on fire. Of course, everybody thought I was black because all hip hop was black at the time, right? I mean, because there was no video on me yet because I didn't have any money to buy a video, pay for a video. The song goes to number one on this station in Georgia, and then a station in Tennessee plays it, and then a station in Dallas plays it, and then record companies started sniffing a hit. Record companies were already looking out for ways to capitalize on the growing popularity of rap. There were things happening that record companies were paying close attention to. The Beastie Boys, Tone Loke, and MC Hammer. So when Charles Koppelman, an executive at SBK Records, got a call about a new act, he was all ears. An attorney friend of mine called and said that there was this um, artist named Vanilla Ice who had a 
record out that was independently distributed called Ice Ice Baby and it was doing incredibly well at radio and they had a deal that they were about to sign with Atlantic Records but there was a glitch in the deal and would I be interested and he played me Ice Ice Baby over the phone and I instantly thought this was a monster hit record Ice was quickly signed to SBK Records for a $250,000 advance I was about, I guess, 19. That's when I signed a major record label. It, it seems like it happened overnight to most people, but there was about three years of, you know, going through the trenches, hard work and, you know, no pay, and trying to just get out there and, and, and get my name out there and do whatever I can do to, you know, get to the next step. SBK was convinced that they had finally found someone who could bring rap to the mainstream. He was this uh, tall, strong, handsome, um, charismatic uh, artist. Hooked was repackaged and re-released as the album To The Extreme. And with the strength of a major label behind it, Ice Ice Baby exploded. It was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Check out the hook one of these Ice Ice Baby is released to radio. Eight weeks later, it's the number one song in America. It was the jam. I mean, it was like move over MC Hammer. Everyone was singing the song. Because I'm a lyrical poet. Fly me to the scene just in case you didn't know it. My sound. I was celebrating my first gold record. Within a day later, they presented a platinum record to me. One week later, double platinum. Two weeks, triple. It's sold over like 40 million now. It's ridiculous. He went from just kind of being a normal guy, you know, trying to get some music out there, just dabbling with some stuff, and then next thing you know, it, it just it took off. I mean, superstardom overnight. I had no idea when I was doing it that it was any better than any of my other songs or any different or anything. Suddenly, Ice was rich and famous beyond his wildest dreams. I'm sitting here in New York City. I've never been here before. They're taking me on helicopter and plane rides around Statue of Liberty. If you want a Rolls Royce here, let's just do it. But one moment in particular still stands out today. One of the best thrills I ever got was, uh, Getting my mom a house, taking care of her, and she was like, man, you did it. <laughs> With the song dominating the airwaves, it was clear rap had finally arrived in middle America. Many saw Ice's whiteness as essential to his success. And here comes a white guy who's doing rap, and uh, it's palatable to, you know, uh, American audiences, and he wasn't as threatening to American households as some of the black rappers were. This kind of good-looking white kid who's sort of acting like a black kid. I think the fact that he was white, you know, um, helped his career at that time tremendously. Vanilla Ice was not the first white rapper. You know, before him, you definitely had Beastie Boys who'd come out and sell millions of records. You had Third Base, who had a lot of credibility in the hip-hop community. But Vanilla Ice was the first rapper in the mainstream to really use whiteness as a gimmick. He presented a kind of, uh, I don't know if I want to say sanitized, but he domesticated rap to some extent. Whatever the reason, it was clear the musical landscape had been changed forever. My record is the first rap song ever to be played on a, on a pop station. In other words, I put rap music in front of people's ears who have never considered listening to rap music. Those people out in the middle of America. The times were right uh, for this particular artist at that particular time. While Ice toured and performed relentlessly, SBK was working behind the scenes to capitalize on his success. Interestingly, Vanilla Ice was only number one for one week because the record label decided to withdraw the retail single to try to fuel sales of the album. The strategy worked, and To The Extreme became the number one album in the country, ending MC Hammer's 21-week run. Ice's head was spinning. Everything happened so fast, it took on a life of its own. And uh, I figured, since I'm signed to a major label, and I'm so young, I don't know anything about all this stuff, you know what I mean? I'm like, just kind of let them drive the ship. I soon found himself surrounded by handlers and advisors. I got uh, these people all around me telling me to do this and do that. I have publicists over here, you know, telling me to say these things in interviews. Next day, oh, we need to dress up your whole stage show to make you more glittery. Okay, okay, okay. They gave him the big, baggy MC Hammer pants. They shaved his eyebrows, a sort of signature look for him. While Vanilla Ice started to feel manipulated, 
SBK Records felt they were only enhancing the value of their fledgling artist. He was what you know him as. We didn't change him. This was who he was. It's the artist's vision. It's, we're, we're not, uh, uh, this isn't American Idol. The tensions came to a head when the label came to ice with another request. MC Hammer had a slow song, LL Cool J had a slow song, Manila's got to have a slow song. I said, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. I went in the office and said, I don't do the slow songs. I don't want to do this, man. It's not for me. Here's a million dollars. We do it now. I said, okay, where do I go? <laughs> Whatever I might have wanted him to do, uh, that would be good for my record company, would 100% be good for him. So whatever I would suggest for him to do was only for his good. These guys are good, believe me. Charles Koppelman is the best. Anytime I said, there's no way he's going to talk me into this one, I'd walk in his office and I'd walk out of there, a million bucks, you know, richer. They would do that to me. They would pay me off with things. I'm sure we had some differences. I don't really remember them. But uh, most often we prevailed. And I think we prevailed primarily because he was smart enough to understand that, that, that we actually knew. Ice Ice Baby was everywhere, and there was no reason to question SBK's strategies. Vanilla Ice had no idea that the tide was about to turn. I had this huge extreme high, beyond anybody they could ever imagine. Sold more records than Michael Jackson, Madonna. I'm way up there, I'm, I'm on this high, and it had an equal low, it had an equal low. And that equal low, I couldn't handle. In 1990, Ice Ice Baby was breaking records as the first rap song to hit number one. Not only was he popular in the urban market, he was popular in sort of the suburban market too. I mean, you couldn't go to a drugstore, a barber shop, or the grocery store without hearing it on the radio. But as the song got bigger and bigger, people started talking about the distinctive bass line, clearly a sample from Under Pressure by Queen and David Bowie. It was a fairly new phenomenon to bring back old hits sampled as a hook and then add the new artist over top. What happened is, is I took one piece out of their song, that's it. Everything else was an original song. In fact, the whole song was done and then we threw that in later. You know, but yeah, of course, that loop is from their record, absolutely. But while the sample had been added as an afterthought, many saw it as much more. If you take that under pressure riff out of Ice Ice Baby, you've got virtually nothing left. When Ice Ice Baby finally becomes this huge hit, it's like, holy crap, no one actually bothered to get permission from them, from Queen or from David Bowie. At the time, it was common for artists to sample liberally without getting permission. It was the beginning of sampling, so there were no hot and fast rules as there are now. It was a, more of a negotiation. You could just do them and get away with it because nobody was selling any records. The minute I did the same thing they did and sold millions of records, then there's some money to go after. Vanilla Ice briefly tried to claim the bass line was in fact original, but quickly said he was only joking. Anyone who's going to claim that this isn't the David Bowie Queen song simply with a rap over top is nuts. And Vanilla Ice even knew better. Anyone who listens to that one time, I mean, they know that it's being sampled, and you know that you're going to have to deal with it. Sampling the songs after Ice Ice Baby hit number one turned out to be a costly error. I paid uh, four million dollars to uh, David Bowie and Queen. I paid about eight million dollars to uh, Wild Cherry uh, for Play That Funky Music and another couple million for all the other little samples I had on the record. But even after the samples on the album were licensed and paid for, Vanilla Ice found himself under scrutiny from the public and the mainstream press. Sampling was done way before I came along, and I'm thinking everybody knows that, but I didn't know that my record was the first time they heard it, so then I was kind of criticized about that. Oh, he stole that. That's Queen David Bowie. I know that song. Of course it is. And when questions about the official biography released by SBK Records came to light, it only fanned the flames of controversy. They wrote up this fake biography with all these details like, oh, you know, he was from the projects in Atlanta. He went to school with uh, Luther Campbell from Two Live Crew. Uh, no, he didn't. Luther Campbell's like seven years older than this guy. It says right here, you said that you dance better than MC Hammer. I'm like, it does? What are you talking about? I never said that. Well, according to him, he had no idea that SBK had released an official artist bio to the press. He had no idea what was in it. It was never run past him. He never okayed it. While Vanilla Ice insisted he knew nothing about this fabricated bio being sent out, the record company claimed the exact opposite. All the information we got 
we got from ICE and from uh, Tommy Kwan. We didn't, uh, we didn't make anything up, nor, nor would we. On November 18, 1990, an investigative reporter for the Dallas Morning News published an article disproving much of the SBK bio. The cat was out of the bag. After the, the fake bio came to light, the press really had an end for Vanilla Ice. All of a sudden, he's a terrible performer. He samples what he shouldn't sample. All of a sudden, people don't like the way he dresses, the way he dances, the way he acts. A few months later, Ice by Ice, the Vanilla Ice story in his own words, was released. The book reiterated much of what had already been disproved, dealing another blow to Ice's already shaky credibility. Remember, this was around the time of Millie Vanilli. People were really, really, you know, suspicious of anything that smelled fake. So, you know, his credibility was really coming into question now. By the time Ice accepted an American Music Award for Best Newcomer in 1991, he was clearly feeling under attack. Negative press gets bigger news than positive press. Vanilla Ice talks this, Vanilla Ice says this. If it's negative, it, it's like, how, you know, it goes to the top. Soon, credibility wasn't Vanilla Ice's only problem. When one night he got a surprise visit from hip-hop entrepreneur, Suge Knight. He came into my hotel room. I opened the door and there's a whole gang of football player-sized guys in there. And I'm like, wow. He has all these stacks of paper. He tells me, basically, you want to, you know, you want to play, you got to pay. Knight told Ice that he was there representing a rapper from Dallas who claimed to have co-written Ice Ice Baby. Essentially, Suge Knight felt that he was owed some royalties or some rights to Vanilla Ice's music. I'm like, all right. So he took a few million bucks. There's actually this huge urban legend that Suge dangled Vanilla Ice over the balcony by his ankles, you know, like threatening to kill the guy. Um, and, and that's what terrified Vanilla into, into signing over the royalties. Suge Knight did not dangle me from no balcony. It never happened. In fact, he was never mean to me. He was never rude, mean, nothing. Um, he was forceful. Nobody really knows what happened at that meeting. Was there a co-writer to Ice Ice Baby? Who knows? All we do know is that, according to Vanilla Ice, he handed over a sizable sum to Suge Knight. While the rumors and legends have persisted, Ice sees a positive side to the whole episode. I look at it in a roundabout way uh, that I contributed to some of the best hip-hop music ever made. Because with that money that he got from me, right, he started Death Row Records. Having taken a big financial hit, Ice needed to get his career back on track. With the help of SBK Records, Ice started appearing anywhere and everywhere, starting with the movie Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. It was a way for us to try and elongate this career and to, to try and find another audience for him. But the tie-in, again, made Vanilla Ice a figure of fun. For 10-year-old boys, ninja rap was like the coolest thing out there. For kind of like, you know, the urban street hip-hop community, mm, didn't really do wonders for his credibility. Rapping with turtles? No. Ninja rap. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Still a fan to this day. Love it. <laughs> There's no shame in my game, man. I've had therapy. In one last attempt to keep the vanilla ice machine chugging, he starred in his own film, Cool as Ice. He stars in this film called Cool as Ice. Okay, there's your first red flag. Second red flag, it's loosely based on James Dean's Rebel Without a Cause. Okay, red flag number two, three, and four. This bad boy biker gang member, Vanilla Ice, who uh, goes through a small town and, of course, meets this good girl. The white hip-hop Fonzie for the 1990s is the best way I could describe him. And he has all these awesome catchphrases in the movie. Drop that zero and give it the hero. It's one of those movies, if you can get your hands on, uh, is fun to watch when you uh, want to have a good laugh. Despite the wretched reviews and tepid public response to Cool as Ice, in 1992, Vanilla Ice experienced another perk of stardom, dating Madonna. She came to me. It was in New York City. First time I met her and I did uh, a show there. And I look out during my show and there's Madonna, bam! The two struck up a fiery romance, but things turned sour when Madonna published her infamous book, Sex, featuring a partially nude Vanilla Ice. She did it without permission from me, and pretty much that was it. I, I, I didn't like that, you know? Vanilla Ice had spent the last three years working nonstop, 
but the public was beginning to tire of him. Any time that your image is almost bigger than the music that's associated with you, you you become a target. That wave, pretty much as I was riding, hit the shore. Parodies of Ice and his work began popping up everywhere. Third Bass put out a song called Pop Goes the Weasel that just really blasted Vanilla Ice. So they hired punk rock icon Henry Rollins to play Vanilla Ice. And he's got the Vanilla Ice hair, he's saying word to your mother. And in the end, Third Bass beats him up with some baseball bats. Kevin Bacon on Saturday Night Live on the Nat X show with Chris Rock was hilarious. How did they make him look like you can dance? I mean, did they do something with the camera? Did they get a black body double? Oh man, no, that was me dancing, man. I do all my own steps. Word to your mother. Probably the parody to end all parodies of Vanilla Ice was of course that done by Jim Carrey, White White Baby. It was one of those parodies that was so spot on that it forever changed the way you looked at that video, the way you heard that song, and the way you looked at the artist. In 1994, Vanilla Ice came out with a new look, a new sound, and a new attitude. He was trying to tap into the uh, suddenly very marketable marijuana craze in hip hop. He was trying to play off of groups like Cypress Hill and Funk Dubious. All of a sudden he'd become this kind of stoner, uh, uh, dreadlock kind of guy, which showed a changing of his musical style, but there was something about that that seemed, I don't know, desperate. The album sales were abysmal, and with his career all but over, Ice found himself in a very dark place. I found myself uh, writing a suicide note and trying to kill myself. I actually wanted to die. 30 million bucks in the bank. Is it in the early 90s, Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby was ruling the pop charts. But I soon found out that fame was a fickle game. Vanilla Ice was almost the victim of his own enormous success. When you hear Ice Ice Baby all the time, and when you see Vanilla Ice's face everywhere, you're going to get a backlash. Timing was everything. It was huge because of the timing. We hit him right at the right time, and it was, it was dogged out right at the right time, because anything that's going to go as long as my record did, two or three years of just Vanilla Ice over and over and over, you get sick of it. So I knew there was going to be some, some point it's got to go you know, down. By 1994, Vanilla Ice was considered a has-been. On the tail of a disappointing follow-up album, Ice found himself with no idea which direction he was heading. I wrote Ice Ice Baby when I was 16 years old. I didn't know where I fit in in life after, you know, a huge amount of fame and everything to just go out and be myself again. I didn't know who myself was. When you think of what it must be like to, you know, one year, 1991, be this huge star, and then all of a sudden, in a matter of 24, 36 months, to have all of that kind of disappear, that has got to really be rough on any human being. Unfortunately, you know, in, in our world, uh, you get your 15 minutes of fame, the media build you up as quickly as they can, and then they take you down as quickly as they can. In his despair, Ice turned to drugs. I didn't want to face reality at all, so I, I turned to uh, ecstasy, and cocaine, and lots of alcohol. It was hard. He was buried in such a cloud, he had just hit rock bottom. And on a cold January night in 1994, Vanilla Ice found himself alone, locked in his bathroom. I found myself uh, writing a suicide note and trying to kill myself. I actually wanted to die. Money didn't do anything, couldn't buy myself friends, couldn't find a bit of happiness anywhere I looked. Despite the enormous amount of drugs Vanilla Ice had ingested, his friends were able to revive him. If his friends weren't we're not there for that time. It could have been drastic. I don't know how I survived it. I took enough drugs to kill an army that night. Realizing he had to drastically change his life, slowly, Vanilla Ice emerged from the darkness. It was lonely at first. I didn't have any friends. I just changed my phone numbers, where I lived, kind of hibernated. Ice's personal transformation continued when, unexpectedly, love entered his life. I met my wife at a party I had on 4th of July. She slipped me her phone number. <laughs> I think he didn't really want to be that person, but was lost. And I think that once he found somebody that he really thought cared about him, he turned over a new leaf and we were on to a new chapter. There we are, <laughs> 14 years later. <laughs> With his personal life on track, 
Vanilla Ice decided to move in a new musical direction as well when he teamed up with Ross Robinson, a producer who had previously worked with bands like Korn, Limp Bizkit, and the Deftones. He had a way of teaching me to make music that I didn't even know existed before. For Ice, making music had always been about bravado and entertainment. We don't want to hear music to be depressed. People don't want to hear angry music. They want to put a music on and be like, yeah, let's jump around, man, great times. Put a smile on everybody's face. But Ross convinced Ice to tap into the pain of his past. The resulting album, Hard to Swallow, was a deeply personal project that holds a special place in Vanilla Ice's heart. It was a time that happened that is caught on tape that transformed me into, I guess, whatever I am today. I owe it, I owe it to him, man. He really saved my life. <laughs> saved my life. While the album sales were modest, it still struck a deep chord for some. It had a remix, a rock version of Ice Ice Baby on it. And that did something to put Vanilla Ice back into the minds of at least some listeners. It created a subculture following, which is what I have now. You can't pick your fans, they pick you. While select few were enjoying Vanilla Ice's new music, the rest of the world still associated him with his past achievements which became clear when MTV invited ICE to appear on one of their specials. MTV's 25 Lame, a 1999 special where four people sit around the set and kind of uh, make fun of um, uh, the lamest videos ever. It was Janine Garofalo, Dennis Leary, Chris Kattan, and none other than Jon Stewart. The plan was for the comedians to roast the Ice Ice Baby video culminating in Vanilla Ice himself smashing a copy to bits. But when Ice appeared on set, he started to have second thoughts. Wait a minute. My video? I'm going to destroy my own video. Yes, I hate my image. Yes, I hate everything. I love the video. I worked my <laughs> off of that video. It was the number one video in the country. So I'm thinking, you want me to destroy this? Well, how about I destroy your set? How about I destroy everything here that you did? And he smashes the entire set. <laughs> He destroyed the glass table. It was like glass and broken pieces of wood and shards everywhere. Bam! Hit the popcorn, it flew in the air. People thought this guy was really coming unhinged. But you know, I mean, it was a really vulnerable moment of him. He's going on the show and they're basically making fun of the guy. That's the whole point of this show. It seemed that Vanilla Ice was still wrestling with his past. But soon, Ice would have much bigger problems to deal with. He found himself under arrest for assaulting his wife. By 2001, Vanilla Ice had been virtually forgotten by the public. He was experimenting with different sounds, different images, different styles, working with different producers, but, you know, unfortunately, none of them ever really caught on. People knew him as Ice Ice Baby, and that was it. With his career in shambles, things were about to get a lot worse when his wife, Laura Van Winkle, made a frantic phone call. 911 emergency. Yeah, I need a police to come out to place. My husband hit me. So sorry, man. Do you need to get away from him? I want him out of here. He was driving along with his wife and they got into this altercation, which was allegedly physical. Ice was arrested for assault and the tabloids had a field day. It's not something that I'm proud of or anything like that, but uh, it happened and if anything, it brought us closer. Rob is not, you know, an abusive man. You know, he's gotten into a few fights and we've worked it out. But after the alleged physical assault, he was sentenced to probation and family therapy. After reconciling with his wife, Vanilla Ice continued to make music. But his next album, Bipolar, was released to little fanfare. It seemed like he was headed for one-hit wonder obscurity when a new reality show came along to shake up the pop culture landscape. So real life, of course, was to take the concept of the real world, but instead of putting regular people in the uh, house or apartment, you put in a bunch of funny, has-been stars, celebrities, actors, whatever. Once filming began, it became clear to Ice's new roommates that his cool exterior masked a deep well of anger. We had an incident where we had to bake cookies and go down the street and share them with the neighbors. And he got, he went off. Oh, you don't like celebrities? No. You're in f***ing Los Angeles, you stupid uh, German uh, Back and get the out of here. And I'm watching, I'm going, man, you can't do that. Don't say that, man. I'm not walking down the street. And I said, wow, this guy is really a loose cannon. But Ice received an unexpected opportunity for closure on the show 
when the group visited a karaoke bar and two of his roommates decided to perform Ice Ice Baby. And I sat next to him and I said, come on, Ice, they're killing your song, man. He says, oh, man, I said, hey, listen, man, you're one of a kind. You're an original, you know? Do your song, man. So I pull up to Mike English and he goes, and he got a smile and he took it. And he got into it. So that was like a breakthrough for him. You know, that's the cool thing about that show is it was an adventure that I get to go on there. I get to hang out with all the other people on there and you get to hear their stories and the side and everything. It was really a cool experience. With Surreal Life under his belt, a world of reality television opportunities seemed to open up. And with Vanilla Ice's in-your-face personality, it was a match made in heaven. <laughs> ah, I really don't like this guy. I got him. He's going in the deep fryer. Ice kept busy appearing on a string of reality shows, from the UK's The Farm to celebrity boxing and celebrity bull riding. Celebrity cowboy Ty Murray invites nine stars to his ranch for kind of a bull riding boot camp. And it was a perfect fit for Vanilla Ice because with his motocross background, he has a real love of danger and adrenaline sports. Although Ice thoroughly enjoyed the show, to many, it seemed to be a questionable career move. If reality TV, like The Surreal Life, are already on the B level of television, then we, of course, started getting the B level of B television. So uh, we get celebrity bull riding, which makes celebrity boxing look like masterpiece theater. Finally, a reality show that could actually showcase Vanilla Ice's talent came along when he was asked to appear on Hit Me Baby one more time. You would bring once famous musicians uh, onto the stage and they would sing their biggest hit song and then they would sing a cover of a contemporary hit. Hit Me Baby One More Time was, uh, was a great experience. I got a chance to actually compete against these other groups. What was nice about this show is it wasn't just something to make fun of these people. I mean, it allowed you to kind of see these people that you may have actually really liked once upon a time. And when Ice actually won the competition, it was a vindication of sorts. That was one of my most memorable, exciting moments out of all the things that we've done, I was jumping up and down. I was a little rusty, but I did it. I pulled it off. But Ice would soon sour on the reality TV craze after he agreed to appear on a makeover show called Remaking Vanilla Ice, where a team of experts worked to update his image. Here's a show after my whole experience with the, the record, the music industry, um, about the gimmicks, the image, everything that I hated about every bit of my career, I felt like I was just put right back into it. And we're going to just make you artificial once again. Ice was deeply unhappy with the way the show turned out. He had gotten himself back in the public eye, but at what cost? The very fact that one gets invited to participate in surreal life is in many ways an announcement that you are a has-been, that you are now a joke. As easy as it might be to disparage the fame that comes from being on a reality show, fame is fame. And also it's a very astute career move on his part on some level because he's still making music. So in a sense, all these reality shows he does are really free publicity for his, uh, for his music. I think the reason that Vanilla did reality TV was because he wants to stay relevant. I mean, you know, what star doesn't? Vanilla Ice had almost become a caricature of himself. It was time to get back to where it all began, the music. After falling off the public's radar in the late 90s, Vanilla Ice managed to find a new vehicle for himself, reality television. Reality TV really gave him a second career that's been quite substantial. So in a way it allowed him to reinvent himself with a different kind of fame. But he eventually became disillusioned with the genre and decided to get back to his roots. The image, the bios, the, all these things is not what music should be about. It's about that personal connection that you can make. In 2008, he released a new album titled Vanilla Ice is Back. While the album didn't chart, Ice continues to entertain a core group of fans. I play 100 shows a year, and now I, I'm so happy that I'm grateful that I still get to make my music and people still appreciate it. People still, from, this seems like five years old, the grandchildren, the children, they still flock to see this man wherever we go. My fans today, loyal. They will be here today, 
tomorrow, the next day. And that's why you can take a critic and give him one of those. Because I'm off. I don't care about critics. I care about my fans. And Ice has also managed to avoid other one-hit wonder cliches. He's actually really avoided this whole pop star going bankrupt cliche because he's made really smart investments with his money. Unlike a lot of stars, he wasn't going out and buying 10,000 square foot house, you know, and like five Lamborghinis that he didn't need. But Ice's greatest source of happiness has always been his family. I'm with him a lot of times and his family, his daughters and his wife and his household, his being the father, the husband, is his number one priority. Everything pretty much that we do is a family affair. You know, if he's not working, we're together 24-7. People like stop you and sometimes that can get annoying. And then just like, excuse me, can I take a picture or like an autograph or something like that? They just like come up to us and like, Dad, come on. You know, family and friends are what this thing's all about. Material things, fame, or uh, whatever, you know, you're not born with them and you're not going to die with them. Your family is forever. Today, when Ice isn't making music, he's enjoying life on his 20-acre estate in Florida. You think he's hungry? Ice and his wife now have two young daughters. There he is. And an impressive menagerie of pets. Bucky Buckaroo. Including Bucky the Kangaroo. <laughs> Even hitting 40 hasn't slowed Vanilla Ice down. He still competes regularly in motocross, which has left him with more than a few broken bones. Both my ankles, my leg, both my wrists, my arm, fingers. It happens. How many guys do you see at 40, you know, jumping over stuff like that? <laughs> He's like a kid. I just enjoy being a jack, I guess. <laughs> it's the proper term. Get back. Get back. Get back. Get back. Get back. Get back. <laughs> you all right? You all right? You okay? Whatever the future holds, there's at least one reason that Vanilla Ice will never be forgotten. It could be at a wedding, it could be at a, a bar mitzvah, and that song comes on, people get up. All right, stop. That is a cool little song. There are very few people who have contributed to the culture something like that. Back in the day, you, me, everyone, we were all listening to that song. We were all jamming on it. It was number one. And the song continues to be part of the pop culture lexicon, even to this day. If you've seen 8 Mile, there's a scene where Eminem freestyling at a club, he's in an MC battle. Somebody invokes Vanilla Ice. Somebody says, hey, look, it's Vanilla Ice, and Eminem has to deal with it. In the movie Step Brothers, there's this fantastic scene involving a high school talent show where Will Ferrell's brother wins the entire competition by lip-syncing Ice Ice Baby, and it shows the parents reminiscing about that talent show victory. That's a great song. It is. Mm. And it is. Once bitter about his mistreatment by the industry, today, Vanilla Ice has embraced his past. I have made peace with my past. I've made good peace with my past. In fact, I enjoy everything I used to hate. You know, sometimes you got to get rid of some old demons to move on. And I think he's doing that. He's also starting to be acknowledged for his role in bringing hip-hop into mainstream pop culture. It actually ended up being, you know, the first rap song ever to hit number one. This is history. You look at an artist like Vanilla Ice, whose fame was quick and dirty. But he really did pave the way for a lot of entertainers that came after him. CNC Music Factory, Marky Mark, even, to a degree, Eminem. Kid Rock came out on TV and he says, man, if it wasn't for Vanilla Ice, none of us would be here right now. And then Fred Durst did the same thing. And I was just like, wow. After a life of such extreme highs and lows, Vanilla Ice's biggest legacy may be his ability to endure. He survived it by being smart. Because in the music industry, obviously, you never know when you're going to be up or when you're going to be down. I've been treated fairly. I've been treated unfairly. I've been ripped apart and put back together. And what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I'm a perfect example of it. <laughs> He's definitely part of the pop culture canon now. They can't write him out of that history. Love him or hate him, Vanilla Ice has endured in pop cultural history. There's never been another Vanilla Ice. He set a benchmark, and I'm waiting for somebody to top it. A lot of them's tried. But they're here today, gone tomorrow. He's Rob's still here. I ain't going nowhere, man. <laughs> I got my family, I got my music, and I'm a survivor.